On this episode of Documental, I will be interviewing Erman Masurusoy on the topics of neuroscience of decision making. So, Erman, thanks so much for coming on the interview. No problem. Thanks for inviting me. So, I figured we'd get right into the questions. Uh, you know, based on your research, what have you discovered about the way we make decisions? And if we make bad decisions, uh, do you have any tips to improve that? Yes, so um, during my time as an academic scientist at University College London, which is a university in the UK, um, I'd say there were two major streams to how I tackled uh, decision making. The first focused on some of the problems associated with our decision making, which you alluded to. Uh, so not surprisingly, humans don't always make the best decisions or the most optimal decisions for in, each, in each scenario. Uh, and there are common traps that we all regularly fall into because our brains have basically evolved to be efficient machines that love shortcuts uh, and often those shortcuts are very helpful but sometimes they drive us in the wrong direction with many of the decisions we face especially in the in the modern world um, so for example we commonly engage in something called confirmation bias which is one of the most well-known cognitive biases where we dismiss all evidence that doesn't fit our prior beliefs and accept all evidence that does fit those, those beliefs um, uh, another common bias is the gambler's fallacy, which is a kind of more statistical bias, uh, where, uh, so to explain this, imagine if I flip a coin and it's a fair coin, it's totally unbiased and it repeatedly lands heads, heads, heads three times in a row. Um, so if I ask you to bet your hard earned cash, your hard earned cash on what the next flip will be, the vast majority of people say tails, even though the probability of heads and tails is always 50% each. Um, and this kind of relates to our intuitive sense of what randomness means in short sequences. We expect there to be more switches than, than there are. Um, and this bias is very persistent, it's very pervasive. One analysis I published a few years ago suggested that elite goalkeepers in soccer penalty shootouts, uh, they show this bias when they're trying to guess which direction the kicker on the opposing team will kick on each penalty. Uh, so if it goes to their left, 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 three shots in a row, the goalkeeper is likely to believe, okay, this time it's going to go to the right, even though the statistics don't seem to back that up. So it kind of re relates to this gambler's fallacy. Um, so yeah, that's the, the first stream is this, uh, some of the problems in our decision making. And the second stream was a bit more philosophical. Um, so it was uh, related to the debates around free will. Um, for many people, their intuitive sense of free will is that they form a conscious intention or make a conscious choice and then the brain begins the necessary activity to execute that choice um, but that of course uh, isn't exactly how it works because all of our conscious intentions are also preceded by uh, unconscious brain activity that we're not aware of so intentions don't kind of float around in a, in a mystical space while our brain executes the things that that does everything is kind of grounded in in brain activity um, so some have argued that this, uh, this is a problem for our sense of free will because it says, you know, it questions whether we're responsible for our actions or how much we're responsible if all this unconscious activity is driving what we do. Um, and many people have also uh, said that maybe self-control saves that concept of free will because even if our initial decisions to act aren't uh, free, according to the intuitive sense, maybe our ability to stop those actions at the last moment is the real freedom that we have. Um, but actually, that's also not quite right if you think about it, because all of our decisions to stop an action are also preceded by this unconscious brain activity that we're never aware of. Right. So whenever you first think, OK, actually, I feel like I want a Coke right now. Uh, you don't know why you thought that there's some unconscious brain activity that reflects that intention and it pops up for you know, a reason that we're not always aware of. Um, and even if you decide at the moment, oh, actually, no, I won't have a Coke because it's unhealthy, you still don't know why that second intention emerged. It just kind of comes into this space of your consciousness without you being aware of its origins. Um, so I showed in, in lots of research projects that um, our intentions to stop doing things, rather like our, our intentions to start doing things, are driven by activity that we're not aware of. And often we can predict your decisions long before you make those decisions yourself consciously. So we can look at the unconscious brain activity using brain scanning methods and predict what you will do. Um, so this was kind of a, another nail in the coffin of free will. But um, again, it's, it, free will is it's a hot topic philosophically right now. 
and people come at it from different angles and there may be a way of us maintaining that free will exists and maintaining the sense of personal responsibility that we care about but arguments about free will or sorry arguments about self-control are not necessarily the way to do that i think there are other ways um so that was the second stream i think you asked about ways of improving decision making yes um so the cognitive biases i started by talking about they're notoriously difficult to get rid of they're very very persistent in our uh, in our thinking and again it's often because we've evolved these strategies over you know, millions of years and it's difficult to get rid of them but the first and most obvious step is going to be awareness so when you better understand the common pitfalls and the common vulnerabilities in how we make decisions you're more likely to spot them when they're happening and you're more likely to be able to counteract them um, for example once you understand confirmation bias uh, you're more likely to realize uh, when you might be accepting someone's opinion too readily because it's consistent with what you know and when you might be dismissing their opinion prematurely just because it's inconsistent with what you already believe and if you if you want to avoid that then of course you can put a lot more effort uh, into actively looking for opinions and looking for evidence that contradicts your beliefs and then judging them as objectively as you possibly can and that's not always comfortable or easy to do but it's a great way of getting out of your kind of small bubble and better understanding the world around you especially in the most polarized areas like politics for example this is all fascinating this topic of decision making is so important i think for um you know people growing up in, in academic institutions it seems like we're lacking courses on this art the art of making good decisions and and really how it ties into your points on self-control because you know if you understand these things and you understand uh, self-awareness you know you start meditating you start understanding why you do things you live a better life you can learn to optimize you know you can be specific about your actions and you realize how your thoughts influence actions so these are all intertwined and i think that when you provide these kind of responses in an interview like this people can practically go out and and start impl implementing this based on you know your points i, I think it's a critical topic oh definitely yeah. i mean from within the academic sciences we're always a little bit hesitant to make practical recommendations too soon because you know, we know that a lot of the evidence will be flawed and it takes a while to be, you know, to be certain that this thing works well. Um, but I think it's important to try and translate what we know from the academic sciences into practical advice as soon as we can. Uh, I mean, you mentioned meditation and it took so long for the psychological sciences to take meditation seriously because it had this kind of religious origin, this quite mystical origin. Um, but more recently, as people have started to study it more and more frequently and take it a bit more seriously, we're finding that it has lots and lots of positive effects that, that make it seem like um, you know, a very positive benefit in your everyday life. So it's, it's becoming much more, a much more practiced um, system, I think. Oh, I certainly noticed. You know, just to shift gears in this, um, in this interview, I wanted to touch upon mental performance. So what, what are your ambitions in regards to mental performance and how do your ideas help businesses? So most of my work currently uh, is with businesses and uh, most of it focuses on just understanding how humans make decisions and how they perceive the world in relation to um, the business's own aims and objectives. Um, so traditional methods of market research, for example, uh, which aim to understand consumers or employees in some way, usually consumers. Um, the traditional methods revolve around questionnaires and interviews. So asking people a list of 10 questions about what they think of a product or what they think of an advert and then using those insights to develop better products or better adverts. Um, and while those methods are good at telling you uh, how people, uh, what people think is true about their perceptions or their behaviors, they're not necessarily good at telling you how people actually behave or how they actually perceive something. So I use experimental methods from psychology and neuroscience to help market researchers improve their insights um, usually by measuring some automatic behavior that people uh, can't control so, so well consciously or just measuring perceptions in a more direct way than asking people questions. And this, can, this has proved to be um, pretty enormously valuable when, uh, when it's used in conjunction with the questionnaires that people are more used to because you can combine the insights from what people think with what people actually do and together you can get a very comprehensive account of how people react to adverse and products and strategies. Um, because sometimes those things are consistent, uh, but sometimes they're inconsistent. Sometimes people believe one thing and do something completely different uh, in the real world. So having this comprehensive account is, is useful for that. 
Um, and the other side to my work is, is the cognitive performance stuff. And it's kind of the stuff that excites me most, I think, right now. I'm actually uh, right now working on a book about mental well-being, which tries to walk through some of the best evidence-backed strategies for improving psychological, our psychological lives. Um, so you mentioned, for example, earlier meditation, and we were talking a bit about ways of potentially improving decision-making and getting away from cognitive biases. And the book I'm writing tries to bring all of the stuff we know together to present it in a way that's accessible to people. And in the past, I've also worked with athletes uh, like elite rugby players on tracking the effects of head injuries on cognitive performance uh, with kind of unique ways that might be better than the ways we, we are, we're already familiar with. Um, so yeah, as a, right now I spend most of my time with businesses, but I certainly want to talk to more athletes uh, and work especially with them on improving their game from a psychological perspective, because it's often the case that they have uh, amazing physical training regimens and they're really in tip top shape physically. But then when it comes to competition, they hit, they hit certain psychological barriers that damage their performance. Um, and then eventually they, they, can, they can end up wasting all of the time they put into the physical training. So I think there's no need for that to be the case. And uh, there are already sports psychologists working with athletes on um, the more psychological aspects of their game, whether that be in football or basketball or hockey or, or many other competitive sports. Um, and I think that continued effort can definitely be improved on. There's a lot more that can be done. Uh, and I think uh, I want to work with athletes on improving um, psychological characteristics and building a stronger mental resilience in their game. That's great, Herman. So can you give the viewers a little bit about your background and how they can go about contacting you? Yes. Yeah, so uh, my primary background is as an academic cognitive neuroscientist. So that basically means I studied brain and behavior in universities and then spent my time publishing the outcomes in research journals, academic journals. Uh, now I work for myself primarily as a consultant and apply my expertise to solve questions that businesses have or any other kind of type of client who's interested in human behavior. Um, and I moved from London, UK, where I was born and where I was based most of my life to uh, Washington, Washington DC around two months ago. So I'm now actively expanding my client base within the UK, uh, sorry, the US. Um, and I continue to work with my UK clients as well at the same time. Um, and yeah, I, I always love to meet new people and learn about their own kind of big questions around human behavior. Um, and it's, great, it's always great to talk through potential ways of solving those questions from my own perspective, which people might not have considered before. Uh, so if people do want to have a discussion or to contact me, I think the easiest ways are probably probably LinkedIn, or they can also follow me on Twitter at Erman Misurlasoy. That's great. And we will leave the um, social media links in the bottom of this video in the description. Uh, but that closes our interview. Erman, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. It was great talking to you. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye.